step up your game. What's up, y'all? It's your boy, Mr. Locario, the bad boy of the dating game, and I'm telling you that if you really want to attract beautiful women, you need to go to badboymembership.com. This is where you get 45 through 90 minute step-by-step dating advice tutorials every month. Just sign up, follow the advice, and you'll get the woman you want. Go to badboymembership.com. That's badboymembership.com. Yo, cupcake season is right around the corner, family, and you need to get your fragrance game all up in order. So you need to check out ashkicking.com. That's a black-owned business that sells all-natural health and beauty products, and it also has fragrance products. You can get beauty products such as body butter, hair moisturizer, face moisturizer, unique incense burners, incense sticks, scented candles, and so much more. So again, you need to check out Ash Kickin', that's K-I-C-K-I-N, Dot com. You need to check out the hottest, newest thriller of the summer called Noxious. A bear's turn fatal when a reckless woman confronts her cheating boyfriend. And after a careless mistake, all hell breaks loose and hell has no fury like a woman scorned. Noxious, passion can be toxic. The movie available right now on Amazon and streaming on Prime. Or go to Noxious themovie.com and you spell noxious n-o-x-i-o-u-s and follow noxious the movie on all social media it's time to get your workout game on and your fitness in order so you need to go to blackdragonfitness.com they have all types of workout and fitness accessories they have boxing gloves they have punching bags they have boxing bags kick bags they also have bicycle accessories they have bench pressing accessories they have runners vests they have fitness watches they have everything you need to get your fitness game in order so again go to blackdragonfitness.com you got to get your body looking right so you can campaign correctly again go to blackdragonfitness.com Download the new album by hip-hop artist Alpha Leo. The album is entitled The Greatest, and it's available on iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. You can get it right now. Alpha Leo actually ran for president in 2016, stomping for reparations, and he's going to be running again in 2020. So get the Alpha Leo's album, The Greatest, right now, iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. The year. 2079. The futuristic nation of New Albion has been created to maintain a new racial apartheid system. There is a planned genocide that is going to target the nation's black population. A small group of black revolutionaries band together to launch guerrilla warfare attacks against their oppressors. Do they fail or do they succeed? Find out the answer by reading the book, Avoid the Machines, the new novel by author Scotty Vasco. Avoid the Machines, now available on Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com. The most intense new video game app has now arrived. A medieval kingdom has been plagued with chaos and disorder. An evil force has dominated the land. And now it is up to the bravest knights to fight back the demonic forces and bring justice to the kingdom of the Moors. Play the newest, most exciting battle fight game app ever, Moorish Kingdom. Available at MoorishKingdom.com. You're now tuning into the king of game, Tariq Elite, on Tariq Elite Radio. Yo, what's up, folks? Welcome back to the show. Glad to have everybody tuning in. My name is Tariq Nasheed. Satisfying. I'm bumping some of that Mink Slide. Y'all know y'all better get that Mink Slide album. We're going to be on tour soon. The Mink Slide tour is coming soon. Us and the APX are going to hit the road soon. So you guys stay tuned for that. The only reason we're not on the road now because uh, the the Egyptian Musk album, our album, is just banging right now, taking off everywhere. We need to be on tour now, but right now we're working on the Hidden Colors 5 film. And shout out to all the family who has contributed to the film. We're up at 50,000 right now. We're at 50,000 right now, so shout out to the family. 
bringing that Ogun spirit to the game. And we need to still get over that hump. We need to keep it going, family, so we can make this movie a phenomenon or the phenomenon that it's supposed to be. We're going to really need the community's energy on this one, family. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, shout out to New York. Speaking of hidden colors, I was out there working on HC5, doing a lot of work out there. We interviewed several people for the film. Oh, man. Um, some old faces, new faces. We had um, James Small. He's in it again. We got to have Brother Smalls. He's always dropping that heat. We got a brother named Jabari. Brilliant brother, brilliant scholar. Queen of Fua, very well respected sister, herbalist, natural healer. She's bringing great energy to the film. Just so many people. I can't even name them all. The, the OG, my man Ice T. The OG LA player Ice T is in HC5. He's dropping some very good game. And a lot of people underestimate or just forget the kind of game that our brother Ice T can drop. We're taking stuff from the the universities to the streets on this one. We're taking it from the university to the streets on this one. Yeah, we got Ice T in it. My man just wrapped Law and Order for the season, so you know he had free time, so we chopped it up. Oh man, he's dropping so much heat. This thing is heavy. And we're not even done, family. We have so many other people that we're going to bring. This this Hidden Colors is going to be extremely, extremely powerful. We can't be playing around now. We got to we gotta get the heavy artillery out as far as the mouthpieces are concerned. I'm going to bring back Shahrazad Ali. She's going to be in it. We need, we need lions in this one. We need the lions and the bulldogs. We, we need the people that's really spitting that fire to hit your chest to get you energized because we're sitting around here like lame ducks at this point. So we need those real folks to talk that real hot game and give you some of those real solutions. That's the most important thing. Oh, somebody asked, did I hit up the breakfast club? Yes. Shout out to my brother Charlemagne. Shout out to my brother DJ Envy. I um I did an episode of the Breakfast Club that will possibly be up. They'll post it probably next week, I'm assuming. I taped Wednesday and it will be, I think, because sometimes when you tape it, 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 it takes a couple of days, but I think it will be up on their site and on Revolt TV. Shout out to Diddy and Revolt. It will be up next week. So we're dropping good game on that. We're dropping some very good game on that. David Banner is in the film. Somebody said you need to get David Banner. What you think? We got that knocked out. I was in Atlanta. We got David Banner in it already. I'm telling you, we getting the heavyweights. We're taking this thing from the suites to the streets. We got some real heavy hitters in this one. Do you understand that? This thing is not going to be a joke. We need to really start letting folks know how it is to just at least verbally stand up for yourself and not just talking dumb, reckless shit. You need some real people who's not afraid to say what it is. How was New York? New York was great. I had a great time in New York. I always loved New York. New York shows me so much love and so much respect. It was hot as a motherfucker in New York. It was hot as hell. And you know what I learned? We, we filmed at a couple of people's homes in New York. Those brownstone houses, those houses, do they contain heat real good? Because those houses be hot as hell. Them brownstones be like ovens, man. I remember in the movie Do the Right Thing, they were just complaining about how hot it was in the house. They kept going in those brownstones, Spike Lee and, and Rosie Perez. They were putting ice on each other and all that. I see. I wanted to get naked and put some ice on my titties. <laughs> God damn, it was hot in them brownstones. Those things must be great for wintertime. They either real hot or real cold. My God. 
But those those brownstones, they they must contain heat. They're real cute. I love those. My, my wife loves those too. She's like, oh, I've always wanted to get a, a brownstone and live in New York in a brownstone. Very cute homes. I like those homes. I like those brownstone houses. You dig? Yeah, my, my man was telling me that um, you know, they got their brownstone decades ago, and now some of them joints are going for like shit, one or two million. I'm like, damn. Because of gentrification, there's a lot of black folks who've lived in those brownstones for years and they've been trying to get them out, but they've held on. And them brownstones are worth a couple of goddamn mil right now. I'm like, damn. You dig? I was in Crown Heights when I went to Brooklyn. I was in Crown Heights. And that's the thing. I gotta. Know, I like to know where I'm going because you never know what pops off. I was at, um, I went to a restaurant in Manhattan and I was just basically on some eeny, meeny, miny, mo shit. It was late at night. I wanted something to eat. And I picked this restaurant um, called Spoon Fed. Real nice, real romantic, little quaint spot off in the cut. And I'm eating there, and the food was delicious. And the owner came out. And he was like, hey, man, I appreciate you coming to my restaurant. This is my spot. It was a black dude. I'm like, oh, damn. So I, I interviewed him for a quick second, and I put it up on Instagram. So that was a cool thing. And um, when I left, I walked out in the street and I was looking for, I was waiting on my my Uber Lyft car to come pick me up. And, and this is the thing, I like to know where I am because I posted this on Instagram. I was in, I think I was in the Hell's Kitchen area and I'm standing there and it's a dark street. And it's one of those streets where everything is like real in the cut. It's like a lot of brownstone looking homes there but some of the spots look kind of abandoned it was kind of one of those sketchy looking areas it was real dark but there was a like white dudes and daisy dukes walking by and they looking at me real funny style and they were looking at me smiling and i don't know what kind of area this is i'm I, somebody said it was hell's kitchen i know it was on 51st it was on 51st Street, around that area, 51st Avenue, 54th Street. I think it was not too far from Central Park. I don't, you know, I don't know my way around. It wasn't the village, though. Somebody in the chat room said the village, but it wasn't the village. So I'm standing there, you know, in the basically, I'm in a, in a on a street. I'm standing on a street by myself, and it's semi dark. And these strange white dudes are walking past me, looking at me, grinning with a certain code in the eye, like they're trying to send a message. And I got on the gram, I'm like, hey, am I cool in this area? And I'm not knocking nobody's lifestyle. I'm not knocking that. I just want to know where I am. And I don't want to, you know, I want nobody to think I'm out there doing some shit I ain't supposed to be doing. That's just my luck. I'm in an area that's known for some type of nefarious activity and somebody say something to me and I reply back innocently and that's a code word for something. You know what I'm saying? That's that's what I worry about. I don't care about nobody's lifestyle. You can be whoever you want to be. But motherfuckers looking at me like I'm a big old ass snack. And I'm scared to say something. Somebody might say, hey, it's kind of hot out here. And I might say, yeah, it's pretty warm. And pretty warm might be a code word for my booty is $50. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to say the wrong thing and it be something that turns on me. You know, because certain people with their lifestyle, they got little codes they do. Like, you know, that that politician got arrested a few years ago he was in a bathroom and somebody in the other stall tapped his foot and then he tapped the foot back and then the cops ran in you know what i'm saying shit like that so i'm only walking down the street not bumping to somebody's shoulder and that's a cold word for dick sucking in that neighborhood i'm like excuse me i didn't mean to bump your shoulder nigga you under arrest for soliciting dick well what you talking about you know bumping shoulders is a cold word nigga so shit like that is what I be worrying about. You dig? So that's why I want people to tell me where I am. Am, am I on Butt Cheeks Boulevard? Am I on Anal Avenue? <laughs> am I on Lickham Lane? <laughs> I want to know where the fuck I am. And I ain't hating on nobody's lifestyle. I just don't want to get involved in no bullshit. You dig? Because, <laughs> you know, I was, I was looking fly that day. I had the fresh cut, you dig? Know, so I'm not trying to let motherfuckers think that I'm looking for some activities. No. But other than that, I had a great time 
in New York City. New York City was the shit, and I loved it. You dig? And again, everybody, while I'm talking, go to the Indiegogo page, and we need the whole family to get involved with HC5. We really need y'all to get involved with this one, family. Now, we got to talk about the Aretha Franklin funeral from today. How many of you guys watched it in the chat room? How many people watched the Aretha Franklin funeral? It was a very interesting shindig. Very interesting shindig. Um, first of all, the shit was hella long. Black folks, black people, black people, we got... Please, my black folks, we got to stop doing this long, drawn out ass shit. Black people, we got this thing where it shit just goes on and on and on. My God. I'm getting on that pastor at the end. Just give me time. We're going to work our way there. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about that. We, I'm going to work my way down to his ass. Don't Don't worry. But like I said, black people, the whole dragging out, I'm like, I'm looking at this thing and it's just going for hours and hours and hours. And I'm thinking, damn, if, if I'm on stage, I'm Minister Farrakhan, he was on stage forever. Poor Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson looks like his health is bad. And I understand a lot of these guys are very old right now. You know, a lot of these people are very old. A lot of people were kind of moping around some people were kind of rambling and that's not i'm not going to shit on them for that you know a lot of people our people are getting older a lot of these people are getting older but i'm thinking well damn is there a concession stand at that church i, I would have been starving i would have been hungry as hell it's the detroit thing somebody said it's the detroit thing was it 10 hours? It might have been 10 hours. I heard it was six, but I, I literally think it was about 10 hours. That was a long ass service. They were bringing everybody and their mama out to perform, say something. They had one of Aretha Franklin's son singing, and I'm like, what he's singing? They had Cicely Tyson came out there. And I love Cicely Tyson. She looks beautiful for 91. But Cicely came out there with that big ass Darth Vader hat. Boy, did y'all see that hat Cicely Tyson had on. Boy, that hat looked like it had extraterrestrial power. She had the biggest hat in the world, and she started... Was she reading some kind of piece from some kind of play? I was... She was very passionate about what she was saying. I couldn't make out one thing Cicely Tyson was talking about. I don't know what she was talking about. You dig? And they had Bill Clinton there... Bill Clinton could have sat his ass down. And, and that's the thing I kind of had a problem with when Bill Clinton was there and Hillary was there. A lot when a lot of the white people were there, there was a lot of plantation jubileeing going on. There was a lot of plantation jubileeing going on. Oh, they start playing that gospel music and and the thing with black folks, when we, we already extra, we do a lot of shit real extra, but when some white people are around, we go extra, extra. All oh, the niggas start praise dancing all over the place. Okay. But what you saw at the funeral, it was a big entertainment service, which is cool. It's for Aretha Franklin, but you got to understand this was very symbolic. It was almost a funeral for the old black leadership and media guard. It kind of had that symbolic feel to it, didn't it? It looked like a symbolic funeral, not just for Aretha Franklin, but the old black media guard and the old black leadership guard, with the exception of Minister Farrakhan, and that's why they didn't let Minister Farrakhan speak by the way. Now, some people did good. Sharpton actually did good. I give him his props. Sharpton was saying some pretty good stuff. I give him his props. They was not going, they did not let Minister Farrakhan speak. As a matter of fact, Minister Farrakhan, in some of the mainstream media pictures, they were cutting Minister Farrakhan out. 
they would just show Sharpton, Jesse, and Bill Clinton. In many me the mainstream media, they were literally chopping off Minister Farrakhan in the photo. When I posted the photo here and went live, some people said, hey, I thought that was Photoshop. No, it wasn't. They just cut Minister Farrakhan out. And I saw some of the right wingers and the alt lice and all these people on Twitter talking about all that racist Farrakhan, anti-Semitic Farrakhan, bigot Farrakhan and all that bullshit. But I knew they weren't going to let him speak. I was waiting to see if they're going to let the minister, Minister Farrakhan, speak. They they had all that buck dancing jubilee bullshit going on in there. And not everybody, but it was a little extra stuff going on in there. But they definitely could have let Minister Farrakhan speak. They had a talking to the minister. And he was probably there because Aretha Franklin probably wanted him there. But shout out to the minister. But I really wish he could have spoke. He would have been much better than some of these other rambling ass people. They're gonna, That's the thing. They've stopped trying to put the minister on mainstream television. They have this benign neglect thing with the minister. They're going out of their way to not give him any mainstream media shine anymore. They're trying to just kind of make him disappear. Even with his Netflix thing, he had a next Netflix documentary and they killed that thing. You understand? But I respect our sister Aretha Franklin for, for still being down with the brother. And that's why it's important for us to really prop up and look up to and help out with grassroots activists and, and movements. Because you just can't depend on the mainstream. She used to give to the nation many years ago. Shout out to Aretha Franklin. Aretha Franklin was a rider. Aretha Franklin was a rider. And the thing is, some people did great. Uh, Michael Eric Dyson, he was, he was, when he was snapping on Trump, that was great. When Michael Eric Dyson did his thing, and Michael, you had to look in a dictionary to catch all the words he was saying. Laborious, I mean, he was going all off on Trump, and that was a, that was a good movement. I, I give him props for that. Um, Jesse, he got up and he he spoke and he was kind of rambling and I didn't really understand what Jesse was saying. Even Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton, you know, looked like he's a little sickly. Some does Bill Clinton have Parkinson's or something? He was kind of shaky and kind of mumbling and rambling a little bit. I didn't know what was going on with him. A lot of folks are asking where was Patty. Um, Roland Martin was there, Roly the Boule Bird. And understand, this was a big Boule Fest, too. A lot of the Boule were there. This was Boule Fest. That makes me think, was Aretha Franklin hooked up with the Lynx? For those who know what I'm talking about. Because she, she was clicked in with a lot of those Boule people, so she might have been a part of the Lynx. If any of my people know about that all my Detroit people or DC people I wonder if she was connected with them yeah she was real cool with um with Roland Martin but that whole thing was boo laid up it was boo lay fest the Lynx that's the female counterpart to the not the counterpart but it's the female version of the boo lay those are the wives of the boo lay usually The Lynx are the, the the women version of the Boule. And the children's versions are the Jack and Jill family. The the the, the Jack and Jill of um, America. I did a whole pay-per-view special about a decade ago breaking all this down. The average black person don't even know about these little secret groups. The average person don't know about secret organizations within black society like the Boule, the Lynx, the Jack and Jill. Yeah, y'all gotta y'all gotta do your research on that. Go check out one of my old pay-per-view specials on MacLessons.com called Black Secret Societies. It's an old one. And I broke all that stuff down years ago. But Roland is definitely Boule. He's admitted to that. And this is not a conspiracy. Jesse is Boule. Um, Sharpton is Boule. These are facts. This is not any kind of conspiracy. Our brother Steve Coakley broke that down years ago too. God rest the dead. But yeah, it was really boulayed up in there. That's why when you looked at the event, you didn't see too many young black people in the audience. 
you didn't see too many young black people and the only young black people in the audience were family members of Aretha. It was the older black crowd, that older black church crowd. And the only young people you saw on stage were Ariana Grande, Fantasia, and I'm saying young in quotes, the youngest people, and you had Jennifer um, Hudson. You dig? Yeah, the youngest people, not even her kids, her grandkids. It was her, her grandkids there. Ariana Grande definitely did well. But this was a thing for was a lot of older black people there. And it was a very symbolic thing. Chaka Khan, she did great. But the grand finale, and, and speaking of Mr. Farrakhan, um, it was some white lady. I think she's a country singer. Was it Faith Hill? She was singing and looked like Minister Farrakhan was in the background low-key laughing at her. That was funny. You dig? So, one of the grand finales was a pastor out of Atlanta. Um, Pastor Jasper Williams. And I think he was good friends with Aretha Franklin and he gave, I think, what would be the final eulogy. And Jasper Franklin came out and he was talking cool at first, and all of a sudden, this nigga starts sliding all up on the coon train. My God, did y'all see Jasper's ass? That nigga, he starts soft shoeing for a minute, then he just went full coon. Where are my Atlanta people? Are y'all familiar with this nigga, Jasper Williams? I, I started raising my antennas when he started. He kind of touched on racism and he gave a real coonish, a soft shoe answer. He was like, a lot of the, these police shooting going on. That means black people, we just need to get closer to God. And when he said that, I, don't know, I said, uh oh, when, when, when they talk about, well, the problem with racism is black folks need to get closer to God. That sounds that's Jesse Lee Peterson talk. When he said that, I already knew. I'm like, boy, this thing is going somewhere else. And then he kept touching on some coonery. When he he said that, I said, uh-oh, where's this nigga going? And then he started talking about black peoples, we be killing each other. Oh, like, uh-oh. Uh-oh. And then, boy, the whole banjo, the, the banjo came on out. He started going into this whole spiel about what about black on black crime? This nigga sounded like a Fox News pundit. Let me play y'all some of the shit this coon was talking about. Jasper, Pastor Jasper Williams out of Atlanta. Listen to this coon. Hold on. It amazes me how it is when the police kills one we're ready to protest, march, destroy innocent property. We're ready to loot, steal, whatever we want. But when we kill 100 of us, nobody says anything. Nobody does anything. Black on black crime, we're all doing time. We're locked up in our mind. There's got to be a better way. We must stop this today. This nigga. And he just went on and on with this coonery. Think down, look down, walk down, talk down, act down. Most times we're low down. Where is your soul? And so, if you choose to ask me today, uh, do black lives matter? Let me answer really? like this. No. 
Black lives do not matter. Black lives will not matter. Black lives ought not matter. Black lives should not matter. Black lives must not matter until black people start respecting black lives and stop killing ourselves. Black lives can never matter. Lord. Lord. Nigga, after this, after all that cooning and buck dancing, even Stevie Wonder got on stage. Stevie Wonder was like, well, look, black lives do matter. Stevie Wonder's blind and was like, wait, point me in the direction of that coon. Who is this coon? Stevie Wonder's blind and he could see the goddamn cooning. I think a lot of people start leaving when he was talking that coon talk. And let me tell you something. That old decrepit coon talking that plantation bullshit. That is the reason why a lot of young black people do not connect with that older black church crowd. I want y'all to understand, and shout out to Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder, a blind dude, low-key G-checked that bullshit. No, no, black lives do matter. You didn't get, nobody was responding to that shit, Charm, in the room. He sucked the air out of the room with all that damn coonery. But I want y'all to understand. That's that bougie boule talking. He went deeper than that. He was talking about the, the, the young black peoples are uncontrollable. The police can't control you. I mean, he, he went full damn coon. That nigga went full coon up at that funeral. And understand, a lot of people there, those older Negroes, those older boule bougie Negroes, they feel the same way. He just kind of got off code and just starts saying the shit out loud. A lot of them believe that shit behind closed doors. That's why young black people don't mess with them. You understand that some of the older black folks who listen, especially the old church crowd black folks, you understand this. There's a reason why y'all cannot really relate and cannot get, get messages to your children and your grandchildren. Because y'all have those same coon views and coon values as that butter biscuit eating Negro up in that church talking that Sambo shit. That's the reason why y'all have all these little boule meetings and these little award shows to high five yourself and prop yourself up as great leaders. And your children and your grandchildren are at home listening to me. That's why your kids and grandkids go home and listen to me. Because they want to hear from somebody who's not scared. Young folks are not dumb. They know scared Negroes when they see it. That scared Negro talk. See, niggas get real aggressive with all that black on black and y'all just need to do better. See, when it comes to white folks practicing white supremacy, we just need to get close to God. But when it's, let's talk about black on black crime, oh, you got all types of reprimand for the young black folks. Y'all niggas need to do better. Y'all got to do better. Y'all savage. Black lives don't matter to none of y'all. Oh, you go super gospel whooping coon when it comes to the young black folks and shitting on them. Y'all sacrifice the young people so you can get your plate of fucking biscuits at an old age. And that's disgraceful. We got this thing where black folks, old black folks, are willing to just dump on your children. You're willing to throw your kids under the bus so you can live a comfortable coon life. When y'all do shit like that, y'all help put a target on these babies' backs out here. When y'all get out there doing all that cooning, you're giving the white supremacists more ammo to justify hurting your own fucking kids. Dumb niggas. Cosby, and Cosby is boule too, by the way. And then y'all niggas have to learn the hard way. 
Niggas have to learn the hard way. Somebody said in HC5, we need a coon section. Brother, I'm 10 miles ahead of you. We got a coon section in HC5. Trust me on that. You're going to want to watch the coon segment in HC5. We're breaking these coons down. I promise you, you don't want to miss that. I'm telling y'all, y'all need to get on that Indiegogo and make this thing happen with the heat we're about to bring to everybody's asses. The white supremacists are going to get some of it, and some of their coon and bedwinch minions are going to get a little piece of the fucking action too. We're not playing with these folks. But understand, this is why young people don't listen to y'all asses and they listen to people like me because they know that I'm going to be telling the truth to them. They know I'm not going to be out here scared and mush mouth when I get around white daddy. I'm not going to be out here praise dancing when Clinton is in the room. I'm not going to be doing the boule buck dance. And they know I'm going to shoot from the hip and tell them what the real deal is. That's why that ceremony today was symbolic of the burial of the old guard. This was very symbolic. This was the burial of that old bougie bullshit buck dancing Negro shit. They're out the door. That's probably why they drug this shit out so long. They just, they symbolically, subconsciously are just desperate to hold on. It's time to pass the torch, and the torch has already been passed. You understand that? And the thing is, I think they're going to do a movie about Aretha Franklin's life. That's going to be very interesting. That's going to be very interesting. And I think they're talking about having Jennifer Hudson play Aretha Franklin. Aretha Franklin had a hell of a life, by the way, y'all. Aretha Franklin had a hell of a life. And a lot of people did back in the 1960s. And that's another thing. You know, a lot of those cats back in those days, you know, these niggas had a lot of secrets and shit. A lot of older black folks be having those old secrets from way back in the day that's not really talked about but known. I know my Detroit people because I I was born in Detroit. And uh, all those Motown people, people who just... There's all types of secrets about these folks from Motown. They were... They come from some fucked up families. Well, we got to understand white supremacy did a number on the black community and it left a lot of dysfunction. Oh, where are my Detroit people? You meet somebody from Detroit born and raised. I guarantee they got a a story about one of their fucked up relatives who was on Motown because everybody in Detroit got a relative that was on Motown. They'll tell you about somebody who's on on the pipe, somebody who molested somebody. That was huge back then. But Aretha Franklin, she has a, had a hell of a life. You know, Aretha Franklin had, didn't she have two kids by the time she was 15? Aretha Franklin had two. That's why one of her sons, he was on stage singing and he looked old. He is old. He's shit. Only shit, 12 years younger than her. Yeah, Aretha Franklin had two children before 15. And. A lot of folks, there were rumors for years saying that one of the kids might have been her father's because Reverend C.O. Franklin, there was rumors about him. And I'm just talking, this is some shit I ain't throwing nobody under the bus. I'm just telling you some Detroit business that's been talked about for decades. All my Detroit people know what the fuck I'm talking about. Then her dad, they say he was on some other shit. They were having orgies, the dad and the church and hell, even Ray Charles was in in the mix back in the day. All them dudes was Look up what I'm saying. What I'm saying ain't ain't no bullshit. Reverend C.O. Franklin, they said he was, they was doing all types of shit in the church. Somebody said just rumors, but there's a lot of other celebrities that corroborated these rumors. Billy Preston would talk about some of the shit that went on in those churches because he was gay. So Ray Charles would, would be... In those little sexual things with those folks. Man, y'all better look up what I'm saying. I ain't trying to put everybody's business out there, but y'all look up what I'm saying. So Aretha Franklin, for her to have two children at 15, when you you a kid and you got two children at 15, 
especially in the 1960s? You done seen some shit in your household that you ain't supposed to have seen. You understand me? You ain't supposed to back in those days. Even now, you that's crazy looking. You having kids at 12 and 11. That's crazy already. But back then, that shit, some real fucked up shit was happening in your household. And not only that, Aretha Franklin, when she was 19, she married a, a, a notorious pimp out there in Detroit. A, um, it was a pimp named Ted White, a stomp down P.I. out there in Detroit back in the day. Look this up. Look up um, her first husband. Man, there's so many street stories out there. And man, please. I was born in Detroit, remember? So folks know what goes on on the streets. But she was a rider. That woman, she, she was, Aretha Franklin was a rider. To come from that and become a legend... You know, you take your hat off to that. And there was rumors, somebody, I'm looking in the chat room, somebody said there was rumors that the mom was killed by Reverend C.O. Franklin. Okay. I don't think Aretha was in the game, but what I understand, her um, her husband, her first husband, would use that trap money to invest in her career because he became her manager. Ted White, the dude who was pimping, hard and from what i heard he was a stomp down pi out there on the streets of detroit and he used some of that money from the mother hoes to to fund aretha franklin's career you dig so i guess he saw you know she could sing so let me get up out this street and use this money from the street but he was abusive to her from what i understand and then they got a divorce and then years later she married the actor um glenn turman oh man she she has an amazing story so um, that sister was probably singing from a lot of pain. Yeah, it was something. Yeah, and that was another rumor. She was with Sam Cooke when she was young, and he was like 23 and she was 12. Ah, damn. There's a lot of stories from those old singers back in the day. They were going through some shit. I think um, Patti LaBelle was raped by Jackie Wilson. Nigga, it was some crazy shit going on in the 60s, dude. That ain't really talked about like that. Marvin Gaye's dad, from what I understand, he was a pedophile. Dude, I might have to do a whole show about all the shit that went on in the Motown 60s. Man, is a what's up, real black historian? Man, man, man. Oh, damn. Some, I'm, I'm looking at some of the other rumors in the room. That's crazy. That is crazy. Yeah, Marvin Gaye's dad was definitely a cross-dresser. He was, yeah, he was a cross-dresser, and I heard he was a pedophile, too. Crazy shit. Y'all know who else's um, dad was a, a, a cross-dresser? O.J. Simpson's dad. Y'all look that up. O.J. Simpson's dad was on that shit. Uh, a lot of these brothers were fucked up back in the day, man. In the, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, y'all learning a lot of stuff, man. It's a lot of stuff that that went on back in those days, man. There's a lot of shit that went on back in the day. All right, so niggas in here just saying this. This nigga said Janet Jackson was creeping with bubbles. Nigga, get the fuck out of here. But shout out to Aretha Franklin, our sister's gone. But the fact that 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 coon Jasper was out there throwing the young black folks under the bus, that's something in black society that we're gonna have to get, we're gonna have to get rid of this thing of us sacrificing children within black society in order to live a comfortable coon existence. That goes against the law of nature. And we're talking about this in Hidden Colors 5. How any other mammal will risk its life to protect the youth. You don't throw the youth under the bus so you can be safe. I mean, any mammal, if you harm a baby elephant, the other elephants are going to come and stomp you the fuck out. Do you understand? And we got this thing where we allow the harming of children, 
we allow disregard of how children are being raised. We allow that type of garbage to happen in black society. And one thing that we got to really acknowledge is that we have a very bad hood rat problem. We got a coon problem and we have a bad hood rat problem. The bedwinch problem, that's pretty much been neutralized to a certain degree where it has a mainstream effectiveness. And I commend brothers, especially young brothers, for helping to neutralize that bedwinch movement, which is very dangerous and very nefarious. You know, for years, bedwinches have been snuggled up with white daddy, getting these jobs at these so-called black publications and using anti-straight black male propaganda to help white daddy and white supremacist society undermine black society. I take my hat off to brothers, and let me talk to black men in particular, black women in general, but black men in particular, for helping to neutralize that whole bedwinch leadership movement. Because when you expose something, like I said on another broadcast, that's about 80% of what you need to neutralize it. Just exposing what it is, exposing the pattern will really neutralize a lot of stuff. This is why I'm always using the words white supremacy because exposing it, and if we expose it in large numbers, that'll help neutralize it because their strength is being covert. Their strength is doing things under the radar. Once you see what they're doing, they're ineffective. And shout out to brothers for getting on code and exposing these filthy little dirty ass looking bedwinches over at the root and the griot and ebony and the essence and all of these little bullshit publications that are now looked at as a fucking joke understand a few years ago these were the go-to publications for the word about what's going on in black society understand The Democrats, they specifically picked some of those Negroes who were centered around the root and all that to be the quote unquote leadership of Black Lives Matter. These are the ones that they actually picked. Once we start exposing the patterns and showing you what they were really about, they become completely non-effective now. That's why they're so mad at me. Every time, even when I ain't even saying nothing, when other people are exposing them, they go back, oh, y'all be getting that shit from Tariq. Oh, y'all niggas be, they go back to me because I was, I helped kickstart the exposure of these ass looking bedwinches because I showed the pattern of what it was. We showed you that many of them used the same code words and there was a pattern to their movements. All of them would call themselves black feminists. All of them were either lesbian or they were dating a zaddy. And all of them had this anti-black male rhetoric. So once we started to identify them, the minute they come out speaking and saying something crazy about brothers, you look into their background and see them all snuggled up with zaddy, you're like, nah, nah, we got you. And fortunately, sisters who weren't bedwinches and coons started to understand the game that was being played because they like to use other black women to hide behind. So other sisters were like, nah, I'm not letting y'all hide behind me with this bedwinch bullshit y'all got. Because sisters understood that bedwinch dynamic at the office. When you go to work, it's the same dynamic. The person giving you the most shit at your job is the the Negro bedwinch who's up there sucking off the boss. That's the one at your job getting you written up That's the one at your job who you think is a sister girl and she's telling all your fucking business. So a lot of sisters start waking up to the game that was being played with these bed wenches. You know at your job there's always one negress that's real friendly with the boss. That's all chummy with the boss. She's always working a little bit later and coming in a little bit earlier. There's always one who's cockeyed and kiki and just a little bit too much. There's always one. And when they look at you, oh, they get real serious. They're like, okay, um, Keisha, you, you didn't turn in your work on time. Uh, they, they always getting in your ass about something, but they cock and kiki with this other chick. 
this other Negro Bedouin who's up there doing something strange for a little piece of change up at that job. You dig? And they and those are the main ones that'll be all up in your face, girl, girl. What what kind of what kind of bundles you got, girl? That's so pretty. They all in your face with that fake shit. Girl, that dress is slaying, girl. You didn't come to play. You came to slay on on casual Friday, girl. What you doing weekend? What you doing this weekend, girl? All that old fake bullshit. <laughs> and you start telling her your business. And then she go right back and tell the damn boss. You say something like, oh, I'm so fucking tired of these white folks at this job. They get on my nerve. She go right in there and tell them on your ass. And that's why they be acting real funny style trying to get you fired. Because one thing a bed wench don't like is other black women around the mix. They love to be the only Negro in the room so they can get all the Negro attention. They love being the token Negro. They love that shit. I'm telling y'all, at y'all job, sisters, the negress, you see Kakan and Kiki in with the boss a little bit too much, don't tell that woman your damn business. No, no matter how much of that sister girl bullshit she run on you. Girl, who did your nails? You gotta tell me the way you got your nails from, girl. Don't tell that woman your damn business. You dig? But the thing is, family, the brothers, we've neutralized many of the dangerous moves of the hood rat. Not the hood rats, but the bed wenches. Just like with that lovey chick. And I love how people got on cold and drug her ass and exposed her ass and said, hey, you're on some bullshit. People saw the game she was playing and everybody got on cold and ostracized her and made her a pariah within black society as we need to do to folks who work with zaddy against us. What we have to do now is use that same energy for these damn hood rats. Because the thing is, a lot of times what we do, we just kind of distance ourselves from hood rats. We distance ourselves from them. We don't have anything to do with a hood rat in daily life, but that the, the hood rats are still equally dangerous. The hood rats are dangerous. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, there was a beauty supply store where the male Asian owner got into an argument with this black woman. Her her little child walked out of the store with a keychain, so she took it back. You know, sometimes children take shit and walk out just, you know. They don't understand the concept of buying. The boy wasn't, I don't think he was doing anything slick. Kids think, okay, I want this. I want to, I'm going to take it with me. She saw that the kid had a little keychain, so she took the keychain back. And the owner of the store, the beauty supply store, he started kind of going off on the woman, talking about she needs to raise her child better and all this old stuff. So she's trying to get him off of her, push him off. And this dude hauls off and socks this woman in her face and bloodies her nose. He socked her in the face like a damn man. So a few days later, some brothers are up there at the store protesting. Some brothers, some black men. They were like, no, we don't want, no, you can't do this. You're not going to be hitting the sisters in the community. And no, we're going to shut this down. We're going to shut this down. You dig? So brothers were out there protesting, trying to shut it down. So what the owner did, the owner announced to the community that he's having a 50% off sale on all the products. And when he said that, the next day, hood rats lined up outside the damn store. Hood rats were outside the store in droves. They were letting folk, they had to let some groups in and then wait and then let another group in. I mean, they were packed up in this place. The brothers were still outside protesting and they were filming. The brothers were saying, hey, don't go in there. Not only were these hood rats going in the stores, this one hood rat started arguing with the brothers protesting. 
the brother's like, sister, don't go in there. Fuck out of here, nigga. But she's yelling. There's a little light-skinned hood rat, and those light-skinned hood rats are the worst. I've always said that. Nothing worse than a light-skinned hood rat. The light-skinned hood rats always got to be extra. So all the other women were in line, but the light-skinned hood rat jumped out of line and ran up on the brothers. Fuck out of here. Fuck you talking to. Fuck out of here. And the brother was like, sister, I'm here for you. The hood rat was like, you ain't here for me, nigga. Fuck out of here. You ain't here for me. Fuck all that. She's mad at the brother for protesting the dude for hitting a sister. This is how ass fucking backwards hood rats are. And we have this thing where we've enabled hood rats long enough. We got this thing where we have enabled hood rats way too long because hood rats are they serve a a minimal purpose for society white society maintains them because they make money housing hood rats you can make money with real estate getting section 8 homes that's guaranteed money from the government so people they like the section 8 hood rat homes also with the ebt cards Banks make money off that because they charge the government interest. So people make, you make money off hood rats. You give them nigger pennies, but you still make your money back. Also with hood rats, you know they're going to underdevelop the minds of their children. That's a given living in the type of environment that's created for a hood rat. So now you're, you're feeding a generation for the prison system. Most cats in prison come from hood rat mothers, unfortunately. So you're going to make money in that realm. So there's a vested interest of keeping hood rats in the position they are from the dominant society. And with mainstream society, or mainstream black society, non-hood rat black society, the thing about the hood rat women, now non-hood rat black women don't have shit to do with a hood rat. Non-hood rat black women don't have nothing to do with a hood rat, but black dudes, black dudes have a habit of using hood rats for easy gutter sex. And that's why a lot of people try to protect hood rats to a certain degree. A lot of niggas use hood rats. Okay, if all else fails, I can go down here to the project somewhere and get a little something from this little Section 8 rat. You understand? It's an easy sexual conquest. I, I go down here, bring a couple of bottles of Hennessy. I'll get mine. Hood rats are good for easy damn sex. And that's why they're knocked up all the time, because everybody goes to them for the source of easy sex. If you want easy sex, go get you a hood rat. That's why they always knock the fuck up. And brothers going to have to get off that shit. We're going to have to get off that type of thing. One of my very first podcasts I did when I did Mac Lessons Radio was value your seed. You don't just put your damn seed anywhere. You don't disregard your seed because then it becomes a, a case of what came first, the chicken or the egg. Which came first, the hood rat or the dusty nigga? Dusty niggas are actually a byproduct of hood rats. You understand the problem was it was non-dusty niggas just going for the easy sex. Let me just bang this chick and go and get the fuck up out of here. And now you left somebody there for the government to take care of and they've given birth to a dusty nigga because now the baby ain't got no, no, no guidance from no man. So he's sitting up here listening to his hood rat mama and all the other hood rats around. So now you've, you've created a dusty nigga. Dusty niggas are byproducts of hood rats. You understand? We, we got to look at the cycle of hood radishness. And the fact that you saw in the video on my Instagram of the the situation at the beauty supply store where there were non, non-dusty non niggas trying to stand up for the black community. You didn't see no dusty niggas out there. That's one thing you didn't see. You did not see none of the dusty Negroes because the dusty Negroes they have somewhat of an Oedipus complex that they have to follow the lead of the hood rat female because they're used to the hood rat female being in the lead. 
So when the hood rat female says, I'm going to go out and get me 50% off on some weave, what's the dusty nigger going to say? Because usually he's dependent on her. The dusty nigga is dependent on the hood rat mom or the hood rat girlfriend for his own survival. This nigga ain't got nothing going on. And this is another thing I've noticed. When I've been traveling around the country, I keep seeing very young black men damn near homeless. I've been seeing this all over the country. You got young black men. I'm talking about looking like they're like 18 and 19 walking around with bummy, raggedy clothes looking homeless. When I was in Atlanta, I went down there by the underground Atlanta area. I saw way too many bummy looking, semi homeless looking young black dudes out there. It was very disheartening. Because there is nothing in mainstream society for a dusty young black dude. If you're raised by a hood rat mom in this day and age, you ain't got no guidance. She's not going to teach you anything. She's not going to give you no game. She's not going to really lace you with anything now. So a lot of these cats, when when they drop out and, and, and when they drop out, because most of them drop out. And you know, I, I dropped out of school, but I still learn game, though. But a lot of these dudes, and this is a new age, too. This is a whole new age where the jobs and shit like that aren't as abundant as they used to be. You got to have certain skills to get certain basic jobs now because now you have all these immigrant groups coming in. So back in the day, you need a little dollar, a couple of dollars. You get a, a McDonald's job. Nigga, the Mexicans and Hispanics and Dominicans and all these people got that locked down. So you can't even get these lower level jobs and i'm not trying to say working at a fast food place is lower level i'm just giving y'all some game so nigga who just dropped out of school and said hey i'm gonna work at a fast food joint dude you got a beeline of immigrants getting those fast food jobs and you ain't going to college you ain't getting no scholarship or nothing so it's bad for a young dude who ain't got no game and nobody laced you if nobody's lacing you with some game and giving you some tips on what to do and how to get your shit together as a young black male, you fucked. That's why my young black dudes, you listen to me, I lace you with game, or listen to somebody in your neighborhood, a, a, an older black dude or even a younger black dude who's doing it fly. We got to get on some shit where we're going to learn some game from somebody. What we have now with young black dudes I ain't talking about the ones who listen to me I'm talking about the, the dusty niggas who grew up in hood rat homes understand they take on those hood rat characteristics where you see somebody who looks like you shining a little bit the first thing you do you supposed to hate on them that's that shit niggas get from their hood rat mothers you see the hood rat mother sitting up just shitting on everybody and gossiping about everybody oh girl that girl ain't shit Girl, she ain't, she about to go to jail for, she, that nigga, he stole something from the store. Just gossiping about everybody all day. They see that, and then niggas do that. And where do they do it? They do it online. That's why we see these little goofy niggas. When we try to have a conversation about some real talk online, we get a bunch of little game, goofy, dusty niggas on here trolling for attention. We start talking about some game. That's why we created the Melanoid 300 page so we can avoid dusty ass niggas trying to jump in the conversation and steer it into some fuckboy talk. Because when grown men try to have a conversation about some business, it's always a goofy nigga raised by a hood rat jumping in the chat room talking dumb shit for the sake of talking dumb shit. Because that's all they know. When you see somebody chopping up some game a real thorough dude is supposed to keep your mouth closed and your ears open and soak up the fucking game this ain't time for you to get attention like a bitch this is why i always dip back into the the game the ism the real man talk and that's why in hate hidden colors five and hc5 i'm bringing in the the, the dudes who hustle, the dudes who are on the streets to really lace game. That's the reason why I'm bringing in cats like that. 
to show you how the game is played on a scholarly level and how the game is played on a street level. There's still rules. And I want to show cats that. See, a lot of dudes think there's a way to avoid having rules, having a code, and there is no way to avoid that. You're supposed to soak up game and soak up that code in any avenue you get to. Do you understand? And we got these hood rats out here that that's allowed to run amok. We're going to have to start making hood rats pariahs within black society. Understand, before the 1960s, you know, you had a couple of hood rats here and there, but to be an open hood rat, you were a pariah in black society. Being an ignorant, perpetually knocked up hood rat, that was very much looked down upon. Nobody was going to give you props. Nobody was going to parade you around as something normal. You were going to be a pariah. Now, people would help you out, but they would ostracize you in the process as they should. But what we have now, we have allowed the dominant society, I'm going to put it back on them, they have made hood radishness the de facto identification of black women. This is why I always try to differentiate between black women and hood rats because I do not make black women the de facto image of hood rats. No, hood rats to me don't represent black women. That's something that the white supremacists like to do. And we got to get that stigma off black women. I don't like that stigma on sisters. The thing is, when you have shows like Love and Hip Hop, and basketball wives and this is what you have you have ratchetness all day I, that's i don't i can't even look at some of those shows no more we have that type of dynamic happening and that's the face of black womanhood according to the dominant society we got to erase that and we got to kind of stop being entertained by that Because the thing is, they got hillbillies and, and trailer trash within white society, but they don't have a daily dose of it. They look at it as a sideline type of thing, as a sideshow, but it's not the main event with them. You know, they'll look at Honey Boo Boo and all that, but if they got a Honey Boo Boo and all that hillbilly ratchet shit every day, they'll start complaining. They'll be like, hey, we don't like this. This ain't cool. They're not going to take that every day. That's why they were complaining about the Spike Lee movie, The Black KKK. In the movie, there was um, this black man, he was um, you know, on, on the telephone pretending to be a member of the Klan, and they made the Klan real hillbilly-ish and real goofy, and the Klan, one of the Klan members' wife, she was a big fat white woman, and a lot of white supremacists were complaining about that. They were like, oh, they're making this, they're making the white woman look unattractive in this movie. You see that? And they do that to us in every movie. Every other movie, there's a big overweight black woman in there. Or every TV show, they always make sure that there's a big overweight black woman in there. You understand? So when it's done to them, oh, they're very aware of it. They don't want you to do that to them. Wait a minute. No, you're not going to show us in a negative light. Oh, that race bait nigger Spike Lee. You're not going to show us like this. Somebody in the chat room made a good point. Italians hate Jersey Shore. Mention Jersey Shore to an Italian. They hate that shit. I remember out here in L.A., where my L.A. people? On Power 106 out here in L.A., they used to have this Hispanic guy named Tito. And Tito, he would talk with a very thick, overly exaggerated Mexican accent. And they had a contest where every day you had to figure out what song he was saying because he would say the songs real fucked up in a Mexican accent. Number three, it is a Darul and a Tante. He would say it real fucked up in, you know, very stereotypical Mexican accent. And that was a segment on Power 106. And I remember there was a, a Latino television show doing an expose on Power 106. They were talking about all the DJs and how popular the 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 station was 
And at the time, Tito was the hottest thing. It was a very popular show. People thought it was funny. But this Latino television show did not mention Tito. And at the time, I'm like, damn, they, they're talking about Power 106, but they didn't mention Tito at all. Yeah, Tito at four. All my LA people know Tito at four. But this television show, they talk. They did a whole thing about Power 106 and all the DJs, and they talked about everybody, big boy and everybody, but they didn't mention Tito. And I said, that's very interesting. Then I figured it out. I said, they don't want to mention Tito because that's negative in their society, this expose was supposed to be about something positive within Latin community, within the Latin community. So they're not going to talk about something that's a stereotype. But the thing is, we'll bring the ratchets out and all of our shit. We have our our events, and the more ratchet, the better. We we allow ratchetness to become part of our culture which is something we're going to have to stop. We're going to have to make these hood rats pariahs. And the thing is, dudes prop them up because hood rat sex is good, cool, easy sex. You understand? We're going to have to get off that. That's why I'm appealing to the dudes, the brothers, because understand, when, when we create institutions, the women don't have to fall into hood radishness. So you're going to have to create an option because the thing is when you're out there trying to protest race soldiers and the race soldier minions from punishing and harming black people, the hood rats, they're comfortable with where they are. The hood rats think that they got it made and anything that's going to shake that up, they're going to look at that as a threat. These hood rats look at having section eight, having a guaranteed roof over their head, having guaranteed food and what little residual change they get, they can get weaves because their lives around center around weave and hair bullshit. When you try to disrupt that, even if they get their ass whooped in the process from the people selling them this stuff, you are more of a threat. When you start talking about, hey, we're going to stop these people from harming you, the self-esteem is so low, it's like, how dare you? How dare you try to upset my way of life? Because that's what they're really mad at. The hood rat in that video where she was yelling at the brother for protesting, a lot of folks are like, what the fuck is she mad at? She's mad at this dude trying to upset her way of hood rat life. Now, somebody was talking about, well, hood rats love weed and all that. Well, they get that for free. They, they just suck a couple of dicks for weed. And, and, and that's what that's about. And they get their weed for free. Hood rats generally do not pay for weed. Oh, they can fuck with that weed. So what little money they get, the 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 money is for the, the bundles. That's where the money goes. They already got the food covered. They got the food covered. They got the rent covered. They got all that covered. So the, the little money they get, that's for weave. And the weed they get, the dusty niggas get it to them for free. So they got life made. But that type of lifestyle is detrimental to black society as a whole. I saw a video that went viral the other day where these two stud hood rats were giving these babies weed to smoke. Did y'all see that? There were these studs. It's real, it was one real light-skinned stud who damn near looked white, but she's actually black. Her name was Michaela McPearson or something like that. Michaela Pearson, and the other one's name was Candace Little. It was a little dark-skinned sister with a blonde weave. So they were stud lovers, and they were actually babysitting somebody else's kids. Some other hood rat left her kid over there, left her kids, it was like three kids, she left their kids over here with those two other hood rats and they on Snapchat giving the babies blunts. And then one of the kids was as young as I think 18 months old. So these kids, they giving them weed and both of these hood rats got arrested. You know, I think the bail was $150,000 $150, each. So a lot of people were very outraged over this and they all in jail crying and all this shit. 
and we got to understand the kind of demonic monster ass broads that we have in our community like that. These two women, number one, they're loser hood rats. And one thing about loser hood rats, they don't like children, especially the stud ones. The stud ones hate children. Children represents femininity. Children represents a maternal factor, whereas these chicks, especially the the the, the butch one, you know, they, they want to be masculine. It's that we, we want to be a dude, so we want to anything that represents femininity. That that's not that's a no no. You know that's why many of those studs are real staunch, you know, abortion advocates. But. These studs were giving these babies weed because on a subconscious level, they hate them. They hate black children and they hate children in general. But black children, there's a particular hate. That's why those white women kill those black babies up in Oregon. They adopted them for the sole purpose of torturing them. This happens all the time, family. I've been telling you all about this for the longest. That's why I emphasize these people doing this type of torturing of these these studs, these lesbian women, they're torturing these babies. This is just some real shit. This ain't LBGT phobic or whatever. Just look at look at the stats. And these hood rats are giving these babies weed because you know what? Misery loves company. These two little filthy gutter skanks. They look at themselves like, I ain't shit. And I ain't gonna be shit. Misery loves company. So let me thwart these children while I have them here. That's the thing about a hood rat. Hood rats and also dusty niggas, they love people being there in the gutter with them. They love a motherfucker keeping them company. They hate seeing somebody on the come up. That's why they love to talk you down back in the gutter with them. And if they can get children, and then fuck the children up so the children can go nowhere mentally, so the children can grow, can't grow, so the children can be fucked up psychologically like them, that's their cup of tea. So getting those babies young, let me give you this weed so y'all don't be shit like me. Let me thwart your growth right now. That's gonna make my day. We gotta understand that's how these bastard ass funky hood rats think. We have to ostracize this type of filth in our community. And it was the the white looking one who was really giving those kids all that weed and the little negress, you know, the Negro will follow anybody if they if they're white or even look white. And I again, I thought this chick was white, but she must she must have a white parent, but she looks like she can pass for white. If she were to straighten her hair, she could pass for white. But hood rats love keeping a motherfucker down. They go out of their way to keep people down. That's why people who rise out above being in a hood rat household, you have a lot of talent. And I even look at certain entertainers now. It's this one rapper, NBA Young Boy. You know, he, this dude is like 18. He got a bunch of kids. They're saying the dude got like herpes. And I mean, just all types of crazy shit going on with the dude. And, you know, for a minute, I'm like, oh, this nigga's real reckless. And then I saw an interview with his mama. I'm like, oh, my God. This nigga's mama was a, is a major hood rat. She talking. I'm like, oh, my God. No wonder this dude is, you know, I'm feeling sorry for this nigga now. When we look at certain people, look at the, the hood rats who raised them. Look at Black China. Some people look at Black China, oh, she's a sack chasing bitch. She's out here just fucking and, you know, trying to get the bag from different rappers and all that. And then look at Black China's mama, Tokyo Tony. Look how clearly fucked up she is. And she's still disrespecting. She, she's always doing videos about her daughter. Chinese, bitch, you ain't shit, bitch. I'm your mama, bitch. You wasn't shit without me, bitch. I could have had an, a, you were a mistake. I mean, the mama, just a her mama's talking to her like this now. Just imagine what was being said in the household. 
Some of these black hood rat households are torture chambers for these babies. It's a cycle that's being repeated. We're doing Hidden Colors 5 and I have a sister named Queen of Four. Wonderful spirit on this system. We were breaking this stuff down. And this is something that's needed, family. This is why there's a rhyme and reason for everything. This is why I'm getting the certain people, getting certain people in the film to break up, break down certain topics that needs to be broken down. Queen of Fool, we were talking about how the black household, we got to have the black women who are healers. We don't have that no more. So you have these broken women with broken energy, spreading that broken energy to the children and to the male mates that come and go inside the house. That's why they're coming and going. This is Sister Queen of Four breaking this game down. And she was talking about the importance of making sure that the women are the healers. And before you can be a healer, you have to be healed. And she's breaking this stuff down beautifully in the film. And we need to listen to this type of stuff because we have terror sales within black society undermining everything. And I'm not just putting this all on sisters. This ain't no bashing the sisters thing. I'm talking specifically about hood rats. And the thing, if you talk about hood rats, they try to make it seem like you bashing black women, but hood rats don't represent black women at all. Hell, black women who are non-hood rats are in the gravest danger being around a hood rat. Let me tell you something. Sisters, you know growing up, if you went anywhere where there was a hood rat, a hood rat will try to jump on your ass. Hood rats are like vampires. They're like zombies to a non-hood rat. If you're a non-hood rat, they'll attack you. I mean, let's just keep it real. Black women who are not hood rats, you are in grave danger being around a little gutter snipe ass funky hood rat because they'll try to jump your ass. Because the minute you come around and sound like you got some sense, they're like, oh, this bitch is bougie. Oh, we're going to jump you. So, yeah, we ain't talking about non hood rat sisters. If you come to school or you go somewhere, and sisters know this, you go to school and they didn't bust in some hood rats from somewhere, them hood rats try to fight you every damn day simply because you dress better. You, you dig? And that's one thing I had to learn too with my own daughter. I had to stop making my daughter a target because my, my daughter, she would stay with me on the weekends when she was growing up and her mom owned a a beauty shop down in Inglewood. And she still does. She still owns a shop down in Inglewood. And my daughter went to some of the schools out there, went to some of the the private schools. So she went to some of the schools in Inglewood. And, you know, the the schools were um, the schools where you had to wear uniforms. She, She didn't have to, she didn't have to start dressing casually until she got to high school. But when she was in elementary school and, and junior high, you know, she went to these schools that had uniforms. So in these schools, you had, you know, some of the well-to-do children from that area because you have um, Baldwin Hills, some of these these well-to-do families going here. But then you have a couple of hood rats then, that then managed to get into some of these schools too. You had a couple of hood rats that managed to get in there too. So if I would buy my daughter something that was a little too expensive she would become a target kids would kind of want to get at her and I remember when my daughter was very young I bought her a Louis Vuitton bag for her birthday I think she was like 11 or 12 which I shouldn't have got it I was just getting it because you know it was a birthday and I'm like oh just I'm gonna give my daughter something real nice so I got her a Louis Vuitton bag and they were the kids kind of start picking on her a little bit the little hood rat started kind of getting at her because she had a Louis bag. So I had to get the bag and just, you know, had to kind of play it down with her. I had to get the bag and keep it at the house because I didn't want to make her a target because the hood rats, the little hood kids were hating on her. You know, they almost wanted to get at her on on that. Like, 
what you doing coming to school with that? You dig? Yeah, it was on it was on some other shit. I'm like, okay, just just bring it on. And you know what's funny? What's interesting too, and this is something my daughter told me. She said one of the teachers was kind of hating a little bit. That's the thing that kind of threw me off. She said one of the teachers even kind of hated a little bit. You, you dig? So I'm like, oh man, let me let me get my kid. I almost got her out of the school, but I said, let me just, you know, let me not make my daughter a target. Let me not get her all this, you know what I'm saying? Let me not make her a target. You dig? But but the hood rats are a problem. And those hood rat studs are really a problem. They're the worst. They're absolutely the worst. But I digress as far as that. But this is why I, I say to the brothers, I want my brothers to step up. I want us to be the thought leaders. I want us to start being in a position where we create institutions so that people in our community, we, nobody's dependent on Zaddy all the damn time. This is why, brothers, we have to take the initiative. <clears throat> we have to take the forefront of getting stuff done. I want us to be in a position to get things done. I want us to get in a position to get things done. And I want us to be able to put things together to stay on code and, and do it very quickly. This is why family, we need the family and I want brothers in particular to step it up with the Hidden Colors 5 call to action. I, I need my brothers in particular to really step to the plate and let's make this thing happen. And I want it to be, it has to be a community effort because I don't want it, I don't want us to fall into the habit of depending on just one person to make things happen, to get things done. I want all of us to be in the mindset of getting on code so that everybody puts something on the plate so we can get stuff happening and getting stuff done. Because other people in the dominant society are very much on code, heavy. They're on code harder than ever. So we gotta be on code, brothers. Our brothers, all the brothers listening now, there's almost 3,000 people in here. All the brothers in here, if you've contributed to HC5 on Indiegogo, we need you to hit that thing again. We need to get this thing over the top so that we can get things going on because we got messages out here and codes that we need to spread on a global level. Yes, somebody asked, is there a co-producer and a producer credit invest? Let me tell you something. We got some new perks on the Indiegogo thing because a lot of people were hitting me up. They wanted to become producers on there. So what we've did, we've, um, we've altered some of the producer credits to make it a little easier for cats to become producers because I get it, a lot of folks, you want to have your name right there on the screen. And, and you know what? Fair enough. Fair enough. A lot of cats were like, yeah, I want to, I want my name on the screen as a producer. So we've, we've manipulated and we rearranged some things to make it easier for you to become a producer on HC5 and get your name on the film credit on the big screen. So that can happen. We made it happen for you. And a lot of guys were asking, we're going to make it pop off for you. Much respect. That's the least I can do. You dig? And it's important for us to be on code because nobody's going to save us. When I looked at all the, the black folks doing the plantation jubilee dancing in front of white mommy and white daddy, at the Aretha Franklin funeral and preachers doing coon talk thinking that white mommy and white daddy is going to save them. That's not going to happen. The butter biscuits are going to dry up. They're turning on their coons. I saw something today on Jesse Lee Peterson's show where uh, uh, one of his listeners called up and called him a, a, a koala bear looking nigger or something like that. His own his Jesse Lee Peterson is the preeminent preeminent coon, and one of his white listeners called him a nigger today on the phone. Hilarious. That was hilarious. 
But the people in the dominant society, they just can't save you, family. Th- that won't save you. And understand this. I got to... Um, even the, the people in the dominant white society who speak up for you, there's only so much they can do before the white supremacists who are on code flips on them. Notice how I say we got to ostracize the hood rats. The white people in white society who aren't racist, they're ostracized by all the white supremacists. I want y'all to understand this. We got to get off this thing, but we want somebody in the white dominant society to, to help us. If they help you, they make themselves a target. They're not willing to do that, family. I want y'all to understand this. They are not willing to make themselves a target for standing up for you. They're just not going to do it. And even Antifa, those are white dudes. They have to cover themselves up so nobody knows who they are. But nobody in white society, they can't step up for you, family. Let's just make that clear. Now, when I say that to say this, if they're in court, do the right thing. Don't get on code and throw a brother under the bus, which, you know, is going to happen for the most part because we're, we're dominated by white supremacists. But people in the dominant white society, even if they like you, they're not really willing to put their own reputation on the line to save you, to really protect you from white supremacy. They're going to put a target on their backs. They're not going to they don't want that to happen. I got a, an email this week from a lawyer. It was a lawyer asking me about some content on Melanoid Nation. And this lawyer was like, yes, we need to talk to you about taking some content down from Melanoid Nation. And they emailed me uh, about a month bef- uh, 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 about a month ago. But I kind of ignored them. I'm like, fuck out of here. So they emailed me again about taking some content down off Melanoid Nation. So I'm like, okay, what, what is this? All right, so I, I emailed them back. I'm like, okay, what's what's the content? What are y'all talking about? So I'm thinking, okay, this is just another, you know, some white supremacists mad that I exposed them. They're probably mad that I exposed them. And I'm like, let me hear what they're talking about. I ain't taking down shit. So, you know, this is journalism. So as I was waiting on the lawyer to hit me back up, I Googled the lawyer. The lawyer was a black woman. The lawyer was black. I said, okay, this is interesting. So the lawyer hit me back up and the lawyer said, well, I represent a lady named Jackie or is it Jaxie? Jaxie West. And she sent me the link of the article that we posted about Jaxie West. And the thing is, the white woman is a white woman named Jaxie West. We wrote a positive article about this woman. We actually wrote an article praising this woman. And the article was about this woman. Her name is Jaxie West. She actually called out racism. She was like, the police are wrong. And this article was from 2015. The article was from 2015, and the article praised her for calling out racist police officers killing black people. And on the site, we were like, this brave white woman calls out white supremacy. We commend her. So we were praising her in the article, okay? And what happened was the article was from 2015, the internet has basically been scrubbed of any references to the woman calling out racism because what happened, a lot of white supremacists started attacking her. She started to get attacked and she has a like a motivational, I, I think some kind of biz, fitness business or whatever. So they pretty much scrubbed the internet of any references to her speaking out about racism and her being attacked. They scrubbed the internet. So whenever you Google her name, the article from Melanoid Nation popped up. You got it? She was getting death threats because she spoke out against white supremacy. So she, they were like, basically, can we take it down so that no references of her calling out white supremacy can be seen because she's getting threatened so much. So that just goes to show how white people who do the right thing, they make themselves targets. 
So they don't want to really be targets. So they're not going to really do the right thing in many cases and step up for us. Because all the other white supremacists are on code to do the worst thing, which is practice white supremacy. And I respect that. I'm going to take it down. I don't want her to be, you know, I mean, shit, I don't need nobody to speak up for us. And it's an old article anyway, so I'm going to take it down. But that's very interesting. And another thing that's interesting is that that shows how a lot of people in the dominant society will scrub the Internet of any information. I notice that, too. Sometimes when I want to look up, I'm talking on air and I might bring up something and I'm looking for a reference to it. I'm like, wait a minute. I can't find a reference to it because the Internet has been scrubbed of any reference to certain things that call out white supremacy to a certain degree. You ding? Somebody made a good question. Why is the lawyer going after me instead of the people who threaten her client? Real talk. Real talk. I'm like, yeah, don't go after me. Go after the people threatening you. You dig? But I digress. But anyway, family, that's been today's show. Everybody, again, let's hit up Indiegogo. Let's make this thing happen, family. HC5, we're getting so deep with this. Family, us having our own media, our own code mechanism where we're distributing a code that's going to be global for black society. Shout out to Julius Malema. He's talking about how all of us need to be on the same page. Our brother in South Africa is talking real good talk. I want to also do something to support them and I want to utilize this movie to do so. I want to put this movie over there in South Africa and have it come out simultaneously all over the world. We're going to offer an olive branch to our brothers and sisters in Africa, particularly in South Africa. That's one thing we're going to do. We're going to use HC5 to do something that has never been done, not even with Black Panther. We're going to do a global outreach where we're going to hit up brothers here, brothers and sisters here, brothers and sisters in the Caribbean, brothers and sisters in the UK, and brothers and sisters in Africa. We're going to have this thing come out all at the same time so we can be on a global page and all get on a global code with each other. My mission now is to really work the movie and get it situated in Africa correctly. Because they show it in little bits and pieces here all over Africa, but I want to do it simultaneously. It's very important to get this thing going so we can get on a code with each other. And I'm definitely going to get it going in South Africa. South Africa is representing hard. They're letting us know that they're down. They're letting us know that they need us. And we, as African people in the diaspora, we need to be there for them. Do y'all understand me? See, people talk that pan-African shit, but never take the steps to do so. Let's not talk. Let's be. I've already been over there extending olive branches. I've been donating to the people over there. So they know we're serious here. They're serious there. So we need to make it pop off on a major level, family. They are ready. So we got to be ready and we got to stop fucking around. And I need the 300 and the 300 supporters to get down with this thing. Everybody, again, go to HC5 on Indiegogo, family. Let's make this thing happen. I would love to get Malema on HC5, and I am working on that. Trust me. I am working on that. I would love to do that. And I want to get some other African brothers and sisters in the film, too. We got, a, we got the film on lock in the UK. The UK is down. I want to get it on lock in Africa. So if we're on a global page together, man, just imagine how that's going to pop off. Anyway, y'all, that's been today's episode. Again, family, y'all see the links down there in the chat room, not the chat room, in the comment section, in my profile, rather. Everybody, right now, go to HC5 on Indiegogo. And let's put that spirit of Ogun on it, family. And we can make it happen. We are African Melanoid people. We are the gods on earth. Let's act like it. All right. Y'all have a good one.